the imitation of Christ. We now come to book three, which is entitled Spiritual Comfort. Voice of Christ in the heart, speaking to the faithful soul. The disciple speaks. Let me listen now to the voice of the Lord God. Blessed is the soul that listens to the voice of the Lord, and hears comforting words from him. Blessed are the ears that catch the breath of the whisper of God, and give no heed to the whisperings of this world. Blessed ears indeed, if they are listening to the truth, teaching them in their hearts, and not to the voices outside them. Blessed are the eyes which are closed to all external things, because they are intent upon what lies within. Blessed are those who pierce through to that inner world, and prepare themselves continually for the revelation of heaven's secrets by the way they live their daily lives. Blessed are those who long to be completely free for God, who shake off every worldly thing that could cause them hindrance. Mark all this, my soul. Bar up the doors of your senses, so that you can listen to the voice of the Lord your God. This is what your beloved is saying. I am your salvation, your peace, and your life. Keep beside me, and you will find peace. Abandon all the things that pass away, and seek the things that are eternal. For temporal things do nothing but lead you astray, and there is no profit in the whole creation if the Creator deserts you. Renounce all things, therefore. Return in faith to your Creator and make yourself acceptable to Him. Only so can you know true blessedness. Truth speaks to the heart without need of words. The Disciple Speak on, Lord. Thy servant is listening. Perfect in thy own servant's heart the knowledge of thy will. Do not let me turn a deaf ear to the words you utter. Let your warnings soak in like the dew. The children of Israel once said to Moses, Do thou tell us the message. We are ready to obey thee. Do not let us hear the Lord speaking. It will cost us our lives. O Lord, my prayer is not like theirs. But with humble longing I pray with the prophet Samuel, Speak on, Lord. Thy servant is listening. I do not want to hear Moses speaking or any of the prophets. Lord God, speak to me yourself. You inspired and enlightened the prophets, and you alone without them can teach me perfectly. They without you cannot help me at all. Prophets may employ words, but they don't give the spirit. They may speak with eloquence, but if you are silent, they do not stir the heart. They record the message, but you make plain what it means. They show us mysteries, but you reveal their hidden sense. They declare your commands, but you give power to obey. They point out the road, but you give strength for the journey. They act on our outward senses, but you instruct and enlighten the heart. They water the ground, but you make the soil productive. They may speak the actual words, but it is through you that we understand them. So I do not want Moses to speak to me, but you, Lord God, the eternal truth. For I am afraid that I shall wither away and bear no fruit if the warning falls on my ears with no spark of response in my heart. I do not want to be judged for hearing your word and not obeying it, for knowing it and not loving it, for believing it and not observing it. Speak on, therefore, Lord, thy servant is listening. Thy words are the words of eternal life. Speak on, so that my soul may receive some comfort and my whole life be improved. Speak on, so that praise and glory and everlasting honor may be brought to you. We should humbly listen to what God has to say, yet many pay no attention to it. The voice of the Lord. My son, hear what I have to say, for my words are sweet and surpass the knowledge of all the philosophers and wise men of this world. 
The words I speak are spirit and life, and are not to be judged by human understanding. You must not turn them to fit your empty complacency, but hear them in silence and receive them with humility and longing. The Disciple Happy, Lord, is the man whom thou dost chasten, reading him the lesson of thy law. For him thou wilt lighten the time of adversity, and not leave him alone on the earth. The Lord I gave my message to the prophets at the very beginning, and even now I am speaking still to all men, though many of them are hardened and do not hear my voice. There are many people who are more ready to listen to the world than God, more likely to satisfy their natural cravings than do what pleases God. What the world promises is impermanent and of little value, and yet men are eager to serve it. I offer what is precious and lasting, and men's hearts remain unstirred. Does anyone serve and obey me with the wholehearted enthusiasm that's given to the world and its lords? As it says in the prophet Isaiah, poor Sidon, by false hopes betrayed, a cry comes up from the sea. And that cry comes up because there are people who will run a long way for an appointment with a little income attached, but to get eternal life they will hardly lift one foot from the ground. They are always on the watch for sordid money and quarrel shamefully over a penny. It's a disgraceful thing that they're not afraid of wearing themselves out night and day for some worthless object, some small hope of gain, but for the possession that cannot be lost, for the priceless reward, for the highest honour, the endless glory, they find it a nuisance to exert themselves at all. And so, you lazy, grumbling servant, you should blush to think that those people are more eager for destruction than you are for life, more pleased with shadows than you are with the truth. The hopes of those people often disappoint them, but my promise fails no one, and never sends away empty-handed the man who trusts in me. What I have promised, I will give. What I have said, I will fulfill, if a man will only remain faithful to the end in his love for me. I am the one that rewards all good men, the true judge of all the devout. Write my words in your heart, and study them carefully. In time of temptation, you will find them very necessary. What you do not understand when you read it, you will recognize when the time comes for me to visit you. There are two ways in which I visit my chosen ones, in temptation and in comfort. And every day I read to them two lessons, one rebuking their faults, the other inspiring them to grow in goodness. Anyone who has my word and makes it of no account has a judge appointed to try him at the last day. A Prayer for the Grace of Devotion O Lord my God, all my good is found in you. Who am I that I dare to speak to you? I am your most wretched slave, an abject worm, much poorer and more despicable than I know or dare to say. Yet, Lord, remember that I am nothing, have nothing, can do nothing. You alone are good and just and holy. You can do all things. You bestow all things and fill all things, leaving only the sinner empty. Do not forget your pity. Fill my heart with your grace, since you do not wish what you have made to be left empty. How can I endure myself in this unhappy life, unless you strengthen me with your mercy and your grace? Do not turn your face away from me. Do not prolong the time of testing. Do not take your comfort from me or my soul will lie before you like a land parched with drought. Teach me, Lord, to do your will. Teach me to live humbly and worthily before you. For you are my wisdom. You know me utterly, and knew me before the world was made and before I was born in the world. We must live in God's sight in truth and humility. The Voice of the Lord My Son, Tread my paths in truth, and with sincere heart aspire to me always. The man who treads my paths in truth 
will be kept safe from the assaults of evil, and the truth will free him from those who would lead him astray and from the snares of the wicked. If the truth sets you free, you will be free indeed, and you will not care about the worthless words of men. The Disciple Lord, that is true. Let it be so in my case. Let your truth teach me and guard me and preserve me to salvation at the end. Let it free me from all evil desires, all uncontrolled affection, and so my heart will be really free, and I will walk with you. I will teach you what is right, says the truth, and what is pleasing to me. Think over your sins with sorrow and dissatisfaction, and never imagine yourself to be anything because you've done something good. You're a sinner, a prey to all kinds of emotions, unable to shake yourself free. Left to yourself, you always tend to nothingness. You soon fall, you are soon defeated, soon lose your peace and harmony. You have nothing to be proud of, but much to make you loathe yourself. You are very weak, far weaker, in fact, than you are able to realize. So nothing should seem great to you of anything you do. Nothing should seem fine or precious or wonderful. Nothing worthy of fame, nothing magnificent, nothing really praiseworthy or desirable, but only the things that are eternal. Above all things, find your happiness in the eternal truth. At all times, find sorrow in your utter worthlessness. There's nothing you should fear and hate and avoid as much as your own faults and sins, and they should cause you more distress than any material loss. There are some who tread my paths, but not straightforwardly. Arrogance and curiosity make them want to find out my secrets and to know the deep mysteries of God, while they give no thought to their souls and their salvation. This arrogance and curiosity leads them into great temptation and sin, for I've set myself against them. You must fear the judgments of God and tremble at the wrath of the Almighty. Do not pry into the works of the Most High, but look into your sins instead. Look at the wrongs you have done and the chances for good you have missed. The devotion of some people lies in nothing more than books or pictures or outward symbols and signs. Others have my name on their lips but have little of me in their hearts. But there are others who have had their minds enlightened and their affections purified. These people are always thirsting for the things of eternity. They hate to hear earthly things, and it's a grief to them to have to attend to the needs of the body. They know what the Spirit of Truth says in their hearts, for He teaches them to scorn earthly things and to love the things of heaven. He teaches them to disregard the world and to long for heaven every moment of night and day. On the Wonderful Effect of Divine Love The Disciple Heavenly Father, and Father of my Lord Jesus Christ, I bless you, because you have in your mercy remembered so poor a creature as me. O merciful Father, the God who gives all encouragement, I bring you my thanks, because you send your comfort to encourage me when I deserve no comfort at all. O Father, with the only begotten Son, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter, I bless you always, and give you the glory for ever. Dear Lord and God, O Holy One, O Lover of my soul, when you come to my heart, all that is within me will leap up for joy. You are my glory, the rejoicing of my heart. You are my hope and my refuge in my hour of peril. Yet I am still weak in love, imperfect in goodness, and I need your strength and comfort. So visit me often and teach me by your holy discipline. Free me from evil passions, and cure my heart of all its undisciplined emotions. Then I shall be healthy and clean within, made fit for loving, strong for suffering, steadfast for enduring. Love is a great thing, an altogether good gift, the only thing that makes burdens light and bears all that is hard with ease. It carries a weight without feeling it, and makes all that is bitter sweet and pleasant to the taste. The love of Jesus is noble and impels us to do great things. It continually stirs us up to desire the next stage in perfection. Love longs to be in the high places 
not held down by anything base. Love longs to be free, cut loose from every earthly affection, so that the eyes of the soul may not be dimmed, so that no temporal advantage may entangle it, and no obstacle cause it to fall. Nothing is sweeter than love, nothing stronger, nothing higher, nothing broader. Nothing is more lovely, nothing richer, nothing better in heaven or in earth. Love is born of God, and it cannot rest anywhere but in God, beyond all created things. One who loves is born on wings. He runs and is filled with joy. He is free and unrestricted. He gives all to receive all, and he has all in all. For beyond all things he rests in the one highest thing, from whom streams all that is good. He does not consider the gift, but beyond all good things he turns himself to the giver. Love often knows no measure, but burns white hot beyond all measure. Love feels no burden and counts up no toil. It aspires to do more than its strength allows. It does not plead impossibility, but considers it may do and can do all things. So it finds strength for anything. It completes and carries through great tasks where one who does not love would fail and fall. Love is vigilant. It sleeps without losing control. It's wearied without exhaustion, cramped without being crushed, alarmed without being destroyed. Like a living flame or a burning torch, it leaps up and safely passes through all. When a man loves, he knows the meaning of that cry that sounds in the ears of God from the burning love of the soul. My God, it cries, my love, you are wholly mine, and I am wholly yours. Expand my heart with love, so that the lips of my soul may taste how sweet it is to love, to melt in love and float upon a sea of love. Let me be gripped by love as I rise in adoration and wonder beyond the limits of my being. Let the song of love be on my lips as I follow my love to the heights. Let my soul, triumphant with love, faint in intensity of worship. May I love you more than myself and myself only because of you. And in you, let me love all those who truly love you. The law of love that shines from you gives us this command. Love is eager, sincere, and kind. It's glad and lovely. It is strong, patient, and faithful. Wise, long-suffering, and resolute. And it never seeks its own ends. For where a man seeks his own ends, he at once falls out of love. Love is sensible, humble, honorable. It's not self-indulgent, thoughtless, set on foolish things, but is sober, chaste, steadfast, quiet, and guarded in every sense. Love is submissive and obeys those set over it. For itself, it has only disregard and contempt, but is full of devotion and gratitude to God. And it goes on trusting and hoping in God, even when he is no longer sweet to it, one cannot live in love without pain. Anyone who is not prepared to endure everything and to stand by the will of the Beloved is not worthy of the name of lover. A lover must gladly accept what is hard and bitter for the sake of the Beloved, and he must not have his allegiance shaken if hardships come his way. The Test of a True Lover The Voice of the Lord My Son, you are not yet a wise and determined lover. The disciple. Why not, Lord? The Lord. Because it only takes some slight adversity to make you abandon what you are doing and start longing for some comfort. A determined lover stands firm in temptation and does not believe the enemy's cunning suggestions. He is content with me in prosperity and in adversity he is contented just the same. A wise lover does not look at the gift of the one who loves him, but at the love of the giver. He weighs the affection and not the value, and he thinks more of the beloved than of what the beloved has to give. The generous lover does not find his satisfaction in what I have to give, but beyond all my gifts, in me. Still, all is not lost if you sometimes find yourself harboring thoughts about me and my saints that are not all you would like. That good and delightful affection you sometimes feel 
is the result of the presence of grace and is a foretaste of the heavenly country. You must not depend on it too much, because it comes and goes. The real sign of goodness and great merit is to resist the evil inclinations of the mind and to spurn the hints of the devil. You must not be alarmed by these alien thoughts, whatever gives rise to them. Keep your resolve unshaken and your purpose centered on God. It's no illusion that you are sometimes caught up in ecstasy, though you relapse immediately into your usual foolish thoughts. You are subject to these against your will, not actively creating them. And as long as you loathe them and resist them, the result is merit and not destruction. You must realize that your ancient enemy is striving in every way to disturb the good state of your desires and to turn you against every exercise of devotion, against reverence for the saints, against holy recollection of my passion, against profitable remembrance of your sins, against vigilance over your own heart and a firm resolve to make progress in goodness. He supplies many evil thoughts to make you feel restlessness and revulsion, to keep you back from prayer and reading holy books. He has no liking for humble confession, and if he could, he would see that you stopped receiving Holy Communion. You must not believe him or pay any attention to him, even though he sets his snares of deception so often in your path. When he insinuates evil, unclean thoughts, throw them back in his face. Say to him, Leave me, you foul spirit. Shame on you, you wretched, unclean creature, whispering such things in my ears. Leave me alone, you evil tempter. You shall not have any power over me. Jesus shall stand at my side, a strong champion, and you will be disappointed of your hopes. I'd rather die and suffer every kind of punishment than say yes to you. Hold your tongue, not another word. I will not listen to you any longer, however much you annoy me. The Lord is my light and my deliverance. Whom have I to fear? Though a whole host were arrayed against me, my heart would be undaunted. The Lord is my defender, my redeemer. Fight like a good soldier, and if you sometimes fall from weakness, gather stronger forces, trusting that I will send you richer supplies of grace. Yet beware all the time of groundless complacency and pride. It's this that leads many into error, and sometimes into blindness that can hardly be cured. You must learn caution and perpetual humility from the ruin that comes upon the proud, who are foolish enough to take too much upon them. On Concealing the Gift of Grace Under the Guard of Humility The Voice of the Lord My son, it's better and safer for you to hide away the gracious gift of devotion and not be proud of it or talk and think a great deal about it. Instead, you must have an even humbler opinion of yourself and regard the gift with caution feeling that you are unworthy of it. You should not let yourself be carried away by this feeling of love and devotion, which can so quickly turn into quite a different feeling. When grace has been given you, you should be reminding yourself how wretched and resourceless you are when it's taken away. Progress in the spiritual life is made not so much when you have the gracious gift of spiritual comfort, but when you can bear its removal with humility, self-denial and patience, not letting yourself grow slack in zeal for prayer, or giving up all the other things which are your normal practice. It's good if at such times you gladly do all you can to the best of your ability and understanding, and do not let your powerlessness and spiritual distress make you abandon all interest in your inner self. There are many people who become impatient and careless the moment things go wrong. It's not always for man to choose his lot, but God has the right to send blessings and comfort when he wishes, as much as he wishes, to whom he wishes, just as he pleases, and no more. Some people have not been careful where the gracious gift of devotion was concerned, and have ruined themselves because they aimed at doing more than they were able. They did not pause to consider their own limited powers, but were guided by their own wishes and not by common sense. They presumed to do more than it was God's will for them to do, and so they soon lost the gift of grace. Although they built their nest among the stars, they were deprived of everything and left resourceless, 
so that their poverty and humiliation might teach them not to fly on their own wings, but to nestle under my care. Those who are still new and inexperienced in the way of the Lord may well be misled and come crashing down if they do not let wiser people guide them. If they prefer to go their own way instead of believing people of experience, they will ruin themselves in the end since they will not let themselves be dissuaded. It does not often happen that people who have a good conceit of themselves humbly accept guidance from others. It's better to have only a little knowledge combined with humility and small understanding than to possess great treasures of learning combined with foolish self-satisfaction. It's better to have only a little than to have much and grow proud. A man does not behave very sensibly if he gives way to unrestrained delight when grace is given him, forgetting how poor he was before and abandoning that modest fearfulness before the Lord which is afraid of losing the gift again. On the other hand, he does not show any virtue or sense if he abandons all hope the moment adversity or any sort of trouble comes his way and falls into thoughts and feelings that show no faith in me. It's often the man who is too ready to feel secure in time of peace who becomes unnecessarily hopeless and fearful in war. If you knew how to keep yourself humble, apply moderation, and discipline your spirit, you would not fall so easily into danger and sin. When you have received the spirit of ardor, it is a good plan to think what it will be like when the light goes away. And when that happens, to remind yourself that the light can return, though I have taken it away for a time to teach you caution and to glorify myself. It often does you more good to be tested like this than to have things always going the way you want them to. It's not necessarily a sign of merit if a man is often granted visions and spiritual comforts, nor if he has deep knowledge of the Scriptures, nor if he's raised to a position of authority. But merit may be assumed when a man's life is rooted in true humility and filled with divine love when he always seeks God's honor solely and wholeheartedly, when he thinks nothing of himself, but truly disregards himself, and even prefers to receive contempt and humiliation from others rather than honor. Of thinking nothing of oneself in the sight of God. The Disciple Dust and ashes though I be, I have taken it upon myself to speak to my Lord. If I think that I am more than dust, I find you confronting me. My sins give evidence against me, and I cannot but plead guilty. Yet if I condemn myself, utterly abase myself, abandon all self-esteem, treat myself as the dust that I am, then your grace will favor me, and your light will shine in my heart. Then all self-estimation, however slight, will be swallowed up in the abyss of my nothingness, and will perish forever. It is there that you show me myself, what I am, what I was, what I have become. I was stupid and ignorant. If I am left to myself, all is nothingness and weakness. But if you suddenly look my way, at once I am made strong, I am filled with new joy. What a wonderful thing it is that you suddenly lift me up like this and embrace me so kindly, when my own weight is always dragging me down to the depths. It is your love that does this, the love that from pure affection surrounds my path and comes to help me in my many needs, that keeps me safe from danger and rescues me from countless ills. For by sinfully loving myself, I lost myself, but by seeking you alone and loving you wholeheartedly, I have found both myself and you, and by that love have been utterly humbled again. For you show me kindness, O my sweetest God, beyond all that I deserve, beyond all I dare ask or hope. May all praise be yours, O God, for though I am unworthy of any good gift, yet in your generosity and infinite goodness you never cease to bless even the ungrateful and those who turn their backs on you and wander far away. Turn us back to yourself, so that we may be thankful, humble and loving, for you are our salvation, our boldness, and our strength. 
everything must be referred to God, the ultimate goal. The voice of the Lord, my son, if you desire to be really happy, you must make me your final and ultimate goal. Such a purpose will purify those affections of yours, which are too often deflected away towards yourself and the things I have created, and that harms you, since you become dry and powerless wherever you seek yourself. So you must refer everything solely to me, for I have given you all. You must view every single thing as proceeding from the supreme good, and for that reason bring everything back to me and return it to its source. From me, great and small, rich and poor, draw living water from a living spring, and those who serve me freely and gladly will receive grace answering to grace. But no one can hold fast to the true joy if he makes his boast in anything outside me or finds his delight in some good thing of his own. He will not feel his heart expanding in gladness, but he will be very conscious of oppression and contraction. So you must not attribute any good thing to yourself or think that any man's goodness is his own, but acknowledge that all is God's, without whom man has nothing. I gave everything, and I want everything back again. I am very strict in demanding the giving of thanks. This is the truth that puts to flight vain boasting. Once you receive real love and the grace of heaven, you will feel no grudge, no oppression of your heart, and no love of self will occupy you, for the love of God overcomes all things and expands all the powers of the soul. If you are truly wise, you will find in me your only joy and hope, for none is good except God only, and he is above all things to be praised, in all things to be blessed. What delight there is in spanning the whole world and becoming the servant of God, the disciple. I will speak to my Lord again, and I will not keep silent. I will cry out, so that my God may hear, my Lord, my King in the heavens. Oh, how abundant is thy goodness, Lord, which thou hast laid up for those who fear thee. But what for those who love you and serve you with all their heart? Who can tell of the sweet contemplation that you give to those who love you? And I see the sweetness of your love in this above all things, that when I did not exist, you created me. And when I wandered far from you, you brought me back in order to make me your servant, and then commanded me to give you my love. O spring of never-ceasing love, what shall I say of you? How can I forget you when you stooped to remember me, though I was sick and lost? You have treated your servant more kindly than he could ever hope. You have shown him more graciousness and friendship than he could ever deserve. What return can I make for your kindness to me? It is not everyone that is allowed to abandon all, renounce the world, and take up the monastic life. Yet I should not think it a great thing to be serving you. How can it be a great thing when every creature is bound to offer you its service? This is the great and wonderful thing, that you are prepared to take such a destitute and unworthy creature into your service and to add him to your beloved household. Why, everything I have, everything by which I serve you, is yours already. Yet the truth is that you serve me more than I serve you. Here around us are the heaven and the earth, which you created to be the common drudges of man, and every day they fulfill the commands you gave them. More than that, you've even commanded angels to serve the needs of men. But what surpasses all is that you yourself have stooped to serve man and have promised to give yourself to him. What return can I make for all these countless gifts? If only I could serve you all the days of my life, if only I were able for one day even to offer you the service you deserve, you are worthy of all service and all honor and everlasting praise. Truly, you are my God and I am your poor servant. I am bound to serve you with all my strength and never tire of bringing you praise. That is what I long for, what I desire. In your mercy, supply what I lack. It's a great honor 
and great glory to serve you, and for your sake to reject all things as worthless. For those who of their own free will submit to your holy service will receive great grace. Those who reject all the delights of this physical life for love of you will find the sweet comfort of the Holy Spirit. And those who for your sake step out upon the narrow way and cease to care about anything in this world will know great inner freedom. What joy and delight it is to serve God like this when it brings real holiness and freedom. What a sacred thing it is to be God's servant in an order, for that makes a man equal to the angels, acceptable to God, fearful to demons, and commendable to all the faithful. Such a servitude is desirable, a thing to be coveted, for by it the highest good is won, and a joy attained that will endure for ever. Our inmost desires need to be examined and controlled. The voice of the Lord. My son, there are many lessons that you have not yet taken in. The disciple. What are they, Lord? The Lord. You have to learn to bring your desires wholly into line with my will. You must be no lover of yourself, but a man who endeavors with all his heart to do what pleases me. You are often full of enthusiasm for some scheme, but you must stop and consider whether your real motive is to honor me or to bring yourself some advantage. If you are doing it for me, you will be content whatever I decree. But if there is any suggestion of personal gain, you will find yourself burdened and hindered. So take care not to throw yourself wholeheartedly into any scheme until you first consulted me, or later on you may find yourself regretting and hating it, though you were so enthusiastic and pleased with it at first. You are not meant to go off at once after every impulse that looks a good one, nor should you run away at first sight from what is unwelcome. It is a good thing to apply restraint sometimes, even to desires and enthusiasms that are entirely praiseworthy. Otherwise your very impatience may disturb the quiet of your thoughts, and your lack of discipline create a problem for the conscience of others. You may even collapse in confusion if you meet with opposition. There are even times when you must apply force and use all your strength to resist your natural desires. You must pay no attention to what human nature wants or does not want, but make it your business to see that the body is subject to the spirit, even against its will. It must be punished and made to accept its servitude until it is ready for anything and learns to be content with little and pleased with humble things and not to grumble at things that do not suit it. On developing patience and resisting desires. The Disciple O oh Lord God, I can see that patience is essential in this life, for there is much that goes against the grain. Whatever I do to ensure my peace, I find that fighting and suffering are inevitable. The Lord That is so, my son. But I do not want you to look for the sort of peace that never feels temptation and where obstacles are unknown. I want you to be able to feel that you've attained peace even when you're challenged by troubles and put to the test by all kinds of opposition. You say that you're not able to bear very much, but in that case, how will you endure the fire of purgatory? One must always choose the lesser of two evils, and so you should try to submit quietly to these present evils for God's sake, so that you may escape punishment in the future that will last for ever. Do you imagine that worldly people have little or nothing to endure? That is not true, even of those who give the softest lives. But they have a good many pleasures, you say, and do just as they please, and so they do not mind their troubles much. Even supposing they do have whatever they want, how long do you think it will last? The people that rise to greatness in this world will vanish away like the smoke, and there will be no remembering the delights they once enjoyed. Even while they're still alive, they're not left to enjoy their pleasures in peace, but are prey to bitterness and restlessness and fear. Often the very thing they expect to give them pleasure brings the pain of sorrow instead. They show no restraint in pursuing pleasure, and so it's only to be expected that in the end they should find shame and bitterness. 
These pleasures are so short-lived, so deceptive, so base, so uncontrolled, and men are so blinded and intoxicated that they cannot see it. Like dumb beasts, for the little pleasure this short life can give, they are prepared to incur the death of the soul. My son, as it says in the scriptures, do not follow the counsel of appetite. Turn thy back on thy own liking. Have all thy longing fixed in the Lord, so he will give thee what thy heart desires. If you really desire to experience joy and abundant comfort from me, you must scorn every earthly interest and cut off every base delight. Then you will find blessing and wealth of spiritual comfort. And as you detach yourself from the comfort of created things, you will find sweeter and more effective the comfort that comes from me. But you will not find this comfort without a certain amount of distress and effort first. Ingrained habit will stand in your way, but a new and better habit will defeat it. Your natural self will rebel, but the burning desire of the spirit will bring it under control. That old serpent will provoke and irritate you, but prayer will put him to flight, and useful work lock up the door against him. On humble submission and obedience, patterned on Jesus Christ. The voice of the Lord. My son, anyone who tries to escape from obedience is really escaping from grace, and anyone who pursues private schemes loses communal blessings. If a man does not submit to his superior gladly and willingly, it's a sign that his old nature has not yet learned complete obedience, but is kicking and murmuring still. You must learn to submit to your superior quickly, if you desire to bring your old nature under control. The enemy outside is defeated sooner when the man within is not in chaos. There's no enemy more dangerous and troublesome to your soul than you are to yourself when you and your spirit are not in harmony. You must learn real indifference to self if you want to win the victory over flesh and blood. It's because your self-love is still undisciplined that you're afraid to abandon yourself to the will of others. Is there anything wonderful in the fact that you, who are dust and nothingness, submit to men for God's sake, when I, the Almighty and Most High, who created all things from nothing, humbly submitted to men for your sake? I became the humblest and lowest of all, so that your pride should be broken by my humility. Learn obedience, for you are only dust. Learn to humble yourself and to put yourself beneath the feet of all, for you are the clay of the ground. Learn to crush your own desires and surrender yourself in complete subjection. Savagely stamp out any sign of pride within you and show yourself so humbled and insignificant that everyone can walk over you and tread you down like the mud of the streets. You worthless creature, how can you complain when men find fault with you? You blackened sinner, what defense can you make? You have offended God on countless occasions, and have earned the punishment of hell. Yet your soul was precious to me, and I looked down and spared you, so that you should acknowledge my love, live in continual thankfulness for my benefits, strive towards true subjection and humility, and submit patiently when you are treated with contempt. On reminding ourselves of the hidden judgments of God, so as to avoid overconfidence in prosperity. The Disciple your judgments thunder over me, Lord, and all my bones are shaken with fear and trembling. My soul is terrified. I stand appalled and remember that the purity of heaven itself does not suffice you. The angels erred, and you did not spare them. What shall become of me? The stars of heaven fell to earth. How can I exalt myself, seeing I am dust? Those who performed great deeds have fallen to the depths, and I have seen those who ate the food of angels, enjoying the husks of pigs. There is no holiness, Lord, if you withdraw your hand. No wisdom is of any use if you no longer guide it. No strength can avail if you do not preserve. No purity is safe 
if you do not protect. No watchfulness on our part can effect anything unless your holy vigilance is present with us. If you abandon us, we sink and perish. But if you come to us, we are raised up and we live. We are unstable, but you make us stand firm. We are cold, but you inspire us. How humble and meek I should feel when I look at myself. If I think I possess any good thing, how little I should value it. I must submit utterly to your fathomless judgments, O Lord, where I find that I am nothing but nothingness, utter nothingness. O immeasurable weight, impassable sea, there I can find nothing of myself but nothingness. Where can there lack any trace of pride, any confidence in my own goodness? All empty boasting is swallowed up in the depths of your judgments upon me. All mortal things are nothing in your sight. Shall the clay bandy words with its fashioner? How can a man whose heart is really subjected to God be moved to pride and empty boasting? The whole world will not move him to pride if the truth really has his allegiance, and he will care nothing for all the praise of men if he has built his hopes upon God. For men are all nothing and pass away like the sound of the words they speak, but the Lord remains faithful to his word for ever. What you should feel and say when you meet something you would like. The voice of the Lord. My son, on every such occasion, this is what you should say. Lord, if this is your will, let it happen like this. Lord, if this brings you honor, let it be done in your name. Lord, if you see that this will help me and do me good, then grant that I may use it to the honor of your name. But if you know that it will harm me, and not advance my soul's salvation, then take the desire away. The Holy Spirit is not the author of every desire that seems good and proper to you. It's not easy to decide whether it's a good spirit or an evil one that generates any particular desire, or even if it originates in your own spirit. Many find themselves deceived in the end, although they thought at first that some good spirit led them. So whatever desirable scheme presents itself to you, you must be governed by humility and the fear of God as you work towards it. Above all, you must commit it entirely to me, abandoning your own will and saying, Lord, you know what is best. May your will decide what shall be done. Give what you will, how much you will, and when you will. Do what you know is best for me. Do what pleases you and brings your name most honor. Put me where you will, and deal with me in all things as you please. I am in your hand. Turn me backwards and forwards. Turn me upside down. Here I am, your servant, ready for anything, for I have no desire to live for myself, but only to live perfectly and worthily for you. A prayer that God's will may be done. Most kind Jesus, grant me your grace to be at my side and share my labors and remain with me right to the end. Grant that it may always be my longing and desire to do what is acceptable and pleasing to you. May your will become mine, and my will always follow yours in perfect harmony. Grant that I may be one with you in choosing and in rejecting, that I may be unable to choose or reject except as you would do. Grant that I may die to the claims of everything in this world, and that for your sake, I may aim at being unknown and unvalued among men. Grant that beyond all my desires I may find my rest in you, and in you discover peace from my heart. You are the true peace of the heart, its only rest. All that is outside you is rough and restless. I rest in you, the highest, the everlasting good. And as it says in the Psalms, even as I lie down, sleep comes, and with sleep, tranquility. We must expect to find true comfort in God only. The Disciple Whatever comfort I can desire or imagine, I expect to receive not here, but in the next world. Even if I had the chance of enjoying all the delights of this world, 
and could have all its comforts to myself, I know they could not last for long. And so, my soul, you will only find abundant comfort and complete renewal in God, who comforts the poor and champions the humble. Wait for a little, my soul. Wait for the promise of God, and you will have blessings in abundance in heaven. If you give way to undisciplined longing for the things of this present life, you will lose the everlasting blessings of heaven. Make use of temporal gifts, but set your heart on eternal ones. You cannot find complete satisfaction in any temporal gift, because you were not created to find your delight in them. Even if you possessed all the good things God has created, you could not feel happy and glad. All your gladness and happiness rest in the God who created those things. This happiness is not the sort that seems real and worthwhile to the foolish people whose hearts are set on this world, but it's the happiness which the faithful followers of Christ are waiting for, and which is sometimes tasted even now by spiritual men with pure hearts whose true home is in heaven. The comfort offered by man is empty and short-lived. The true comfort that is rich in blessing is the gift of truth in the heart. The devout man has Jesus with him everywhere to be his comforter, and to him he says, Be near me, Lord Jesus, always and everywhere. Let me find my comfort in glad willingness to receive no comfort from men. And if your comfort fails me, let me accept as my highest comfort the testing that it's your righteous will to send me. For, as Scripture says, you will not always be finding fault. Your frown does not last for ever. We should leave all our anxiety with God. The voice of the Lord. My son, let me do what I want with you, since I know what is best. Your thoughts are the thoughts of a man, and you judge as your human emotions suggest. The Disciple Lord, what you say is true. You care for me more than I can ever care for myself, and any man who will not leave all his care with you will stand very insecurely. Lord, provided my will stands firm, always turned towards you, deal with me as you wish. Whatever you do with me, it can only be good. If you wish me to be in darkness, may your name be praised. If you wish me to be in the light, let me praise you again. If you graciously send me comfort, I shall praise you. If you wish me to be troubled, I shall praise you forever, just the same. The Lord My son, that is the attitude you must have if you wish to walk with me. You must be just as ready to suffer as to experience joy, just as willing to be poor and empty as to be rich and full. The Disciple Lord, I will gladly endure for your sake whatever you wish to come my way. I am equally prepared to accept from your hand good or bad, sweet or bitter, the joyful and the sad, and for everything that happens to me to offer you my thanks. Keep me safe from all sin, and I will not fear death or hell. Provided you do not leave me always forsaken and do not block me out of the book of life, no misfortune that comes upon me will do me any harm. We must patiently endure the miseries of this life, as Christ did before us. The voice of the Lord. My son, I came down from heaven to save you, and I accepted the miseries of your life, not from necessity, but from love, wanting you to learn patience and to bear the miseries of earthly life without rebelling. From the moment of my birth, right after my death on the cross, I was never free from suffering. I knew the lack of every earthly possession, and I often heard an outcry raised against me. In compassion, I bore with humiliation and insult. For kindness, I met ingratitude. For miracles, blasphemy. For teaching, criticism. The Disciple Lord, you lived your earthly life with patience, and in this, more than anything else, you obeyed your Father's command. So it is only right that a wretched sinner like me should wait in patience and obedience to your will, and for my own salvation support the burden of this life of mortality as long as you command. 
even if we find this earthly life a burden, it has been made a source of merit through your grace. And your example and the traces left by the saints who followed you have made it brighter and easier for weaker people to bear. Besides, there's more comfort now than there was under the old law, when the door of heaven remained firmly shut, and even the road to heaven seemed darker, when there were so few who cared to look for the heavenly kingdom. Indeed, until your passion and sacred death, there was no way into the heavenly kingdom, even for those who were righteous and destined to be saved. What endless thanks I owe you for graciously showing me and all who believe in you the straight good road to your eternal kingdom. For the life you lived is our life, and by holy patience we travel towards you our reward at the end of the journey. If you had not gone before and told us what to do, would anyone try to follow? It's a sad thought that many people would not get very far if they could not fix their eyes on your shining example. Our enthusiasm is so lukewarm even when we've been told what you did and taught. What would happen if we did not have so bright a light to guide us as we follow? How injury should be accepted and how real patience is revealed. The voice of the Lord. What is it that I hear you saying, my son? Look at my sufferings and the sufferings of the saints and stop complaining. Your battle against sin has not yet called for bloodshed. What you have to face is hardly anything compared with the real sufferings of those who've met strong temptations and been hard-pressed and tested and tried out time and time again. Turn over in your mind the heavy trials of others, and your own insignificant ones will be easier to bear. If you do not think they are insignificant, take care that it is not your lack of patience that causes that as well. But whether they are great or small, aim at bearing them all with patience. If you make up your mind to submit to these things patiently, you will be acting wisely and will acquire more merit. Besides, you will find them easier to bear if you work hard to develop the right attitude and make it into a habit. You must not say, I am quite unable to submit to this sort of thing coming from a man like that, and it's not the sort of thing I should be asked to accept. He's done me a great deal of harm and accused me of something that never entered my head. Still, I would accept it from another man, provided I thought it the sort of thing I should be asked to accept. This kind of thinking is very foolish. It's always weighing up what injuries it's received from which people instead of keeping in mind that there's a virtue in patience and that a reward awaits it from God. A man is not really patient if he's only prepared to submit to what he thinks right from the person whom he chooses. The really patient man does not mind who it is that puts him to the test, whether it's his superior or an equal or subordinate, whether it's a good holy man or a wicked and unworthy one. Whenever anything happens that's hard to bear, however difficult it is and whoever causes it, he accepts it all with thanks as a gift from the hand of God. In his eyes, it's a great benefit, because God will not let anything that's endured for his sake, however small it is, pass by without reward. So if you want to be victorious, you must be ready for a fight. The only way to win a crown for endurance is to take part in a struggle. You reject any chance of the crown if you refuse to endure. But if you want the crown, you must boldly engage in the struggle and face all that comes with patience. The road to rest must pass through toil, and there's no victory that is not preceded by a battle. The Disciple Lord, I see I cannot do this by nature. Make me able to do it by grace. You know that I am not able to endure very much, and that I am downcast by the slightest difficulty. Grant that for your sake I may come to love and desire any hardship that puts me to the test. For salvation is brought to my soul when I undergo suffering and trouble for you. A Confession of Weakness and a consideration of the miseries of this life. The Disciple 
With the psalmist, I say, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. I will confess my weakness to you, Lord. Often it's such a small thing that makes me downcast and sad. I make up my mind to act boldly, and when a little temptation comes, I suffer anguish out of all proportion. Sometimes it's quite an unimportant thing that gives rise to serious temptation. And just when I think I'm safe for a while, before I realize what's happening, a little gust of wind almost has me over. O oh Lord, I come abjectly before you. See this weakness, which you already know so well. Take pity on me. Save me from sinking in the mire. Do not leave me lying dejected for ever. I am struck down and filled with shame in your presence by the thought that I fall so easily and have no strength to resist my desires. Even if I do not give way to them, they still attack continually, and I find it worrying and hard. One grows so tired of living in continual strife like this. And what makes me so aware of my weakness is that these abominable imaginings never go away as quickly as they come. Great God of Israel, lover of faithful souls, take pity on the labors and sorrows of your servant, and be at his side wherever he goes. Make me strong with the strength of heaven, or else the old self, my hateful flesh, will lord it over me. But my spirit as yet cannot control my flesh, and as long as this life of sorrows is mine, I must battle against it. What a life this is! There's no end to trouble and sorrow, and everything is full of snares and enemies. When one trial or temptation goes away, another comes, and sometimes we're still wrestling with the previous problem when new ones are suddenly added to it. How can we love life when it brings so much bitterness and is exposed to so many misfortunes and so much unhappiness? How can we even call it life when it brings so much death and destruction? Yet we do love it, and many people expect to find happiness in it. We often blame this world for its deceitfulness and unreality, and yet we find it hard to renounce it because the corrupt desires of the body still have too much power. Some things make us love the world, while others turn us against it. What makes us love the world is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. But these things bring their own punishment with all its misery, and then we begin to feel hatred and loathing of the world. But the sad thing is that base pleasures still win the day in the worldly mind, and it imagines that the thorns are concealing something sweet. This is because it's never caught a glimpse or had a taste of the sweetness of God, of the inward joy of goodness. But to those who reject the world completely and submit to the holy discipline of the cloister in order to live for God, that divine delight promised to those who truly leave all is surely given. And so they see how often the world is led astray and how mistaken it is. Above all God's gifts, our ultimate rest is in Him. The Disciple My soul, in everything, and yet beyond everything, you must find your rest in the Lord, for He is the eternal rest of the saints. Most sweet and beloved Jesus, grant that I may find my rest in you beyond all that you've created, beyond all health and beauty, all glory and honor, beyond power and rank, knowledge and ability beyond riches and talents, beyond gladness and joy, beyond fame and reputation, beyond sweetness and comfort, beyond hopes and promises, rewards and desires, beyond all the gifts and favors that are in your power to give, beyond all the gladness and rejoicing that are in our power to feel, beyond angels and archangels and all the host of heaven, beyond all things visible and invisible, beyond anything which is not you, O God. My Lord and my God, you are good above all that is good. You alone are most high, most mighty, most sufficient, most complete. You alone are full of sweetness, of comfort, of beauty and love. You alone are exalted and glorious above all things, and in you all good things have their perfect existence, as they always have done and as they always shall. 
Therefore, I'm not satisfied by anything you give me that is not yourself, nor by any promise or revelation that does not let me see you and receive you fully. My heart cannot really rest or find full satisfaction unless it rests in you, soaring beyond all your gifts, beyond the whole creation. O Jesus Christ, Bridegroom Beloved, Lover Most Pure, Ruler of all creation, who will give me the wings of true liberty, so that I may fly away to rest in you? When shall I know freedom from all things? When shall I really see how gracious, O Lord my God, you are? When shall I be able to seal every thought and gaze on you? Then shall I forget myself in love of you, and leaving the common ways of prayer, pass beyond all sense and measure, and be conscious only of you. But as it is, I often cry out in grief. I groan beneath the load of my unhappy state. This veil of sorrows is full of countless evils, which worry and sadden me, and fill my life with gloom. They hinder me and distract me, entice and ensnare me, and so I cannot approach you without hindrance, and enjoy that sweet embrace of yours, which the blessed spirits know continually. O Jesus, radiance of the eternal splendor, and comfort of the pilgrim soul, pity my sighs, and the utter desolation I suffer here on earth. Even when I do not speak, my face is before you, and my silence cries out to you. How long will my Lord put off his coming? If only he would come to his poor servant and make him glad. If only he would stretch out his hand and snatch his wretched follower out of all his misery. O oh, come, O oh, come, for no day or hour will know happiness without you. You are my joy, and without you my table is bare. I am a pitiful wretch, a prisoner lying in chains, until you cheer me with the light of your presence and give me my freedom and look on me with love. Others may fill their lives with many things in place of you, but nothing will ever content me, O oh God, until I have you, my hope and eternal salvation. I will not hold my tongue or cease to pray to you until your grace returns and you speak to me in my heart. The Lord See, I am here. I have come because you called me. Your tears and the longing of your soul, the repentance and humbling of your heart, moved me and brought me to you. The Disciple Lord, I called out to you because I longed for you. I was prepared to give up everything else if I could only have you. Yet it was you that first moved me and made me look for you. Blessings on your name, O Lord. You have shown your servant this goodness out of the richness of your mercy. What can your servant say as he stands before you? He can only humble himself before you, remembering his sinfulness and worthlessness. In all the wonders of heaven and earth, there's nothing that approaches you. Your works are very good, your judgments are true, and all things are guided by your providence. O wisdom of the Father, may praise and glory be yours. My lips shall bring you praise and blessings. My soul shall praise you with the whole creation. On considering God's many different gifts. The Disciple O Lord, teach my heart to understand your laws and show me how to walk in obedience to your commands. Make me know what is your will for me, and help me to consider all your good gifts, both in general and in particular, with such reverence and careful thought, that from now on I may offer you thanks as I should. Yet I know and confess that I cannot offer you the thankful praise I owe for even the smallest thing. I am less than all the good things I have received, and when I consider your generosity... My spirit falters, and I cannot take it in. All our powers of body and spirit, every gift both natural and supernatural, outward or inward, comes as a blessing from you, and reveals your goodness, generosity, and love, for you have given us all that is good. One man may receive more, and another less, but all the gifts are yours, and without you no man can possess anything at all. If a man receives more, he has no right to boast of his merits, or think himself superior to other men, or treat with contempt 
those who have less than himself. It's the man who takes the least credit to himself and shows the greatest humility and devotion in offering thanks to God, who is really the greatest and best. It's the man who has the humblest opinion of himself and thinks himself quite unworthy of receiving any gift who is the most fitted to receive great gifts. If a man receives less, he must not feel miserable or aggrieved about it or envy the man with more, but he should turn his eyes on you and praise your goodness, because you pour out your gift so richly, so generously and so freely, making no distinction between man and man. All gifts come from you, and it is you we must praise for them all. You know what is best to give each one, and since it's clear to you what each man's merits are, it is for you and not for us to decide why one has less and another more. And so, O oh Lord God, I can even consider it a great blessing if I do not have much to bring me praise and glory from men. For when a man does not have much, he can look at his poverty and worthlessness, and far from feeling burdened and sorrowful and dejected, he can feel comforted and glad. For it's the poor and humble and despised in the eyes of the world that you have chosen, O oh God, to be the familiar members of your household. Your apostles bear witness to this, for, as the psalmist put it, you have made them princes in all the earth. Yet they spent their lives in this world without complaint, and were so humble and devoid of pride, so completely free of all malice and guile, that they rejoiced to suffer humiliation for your sake, and gladly embraced things that the world regards with horror. If a man loves you and acknowledges your goodness, he should find joy above all else in the fulfillment in his own life of your will and of your everlasting decree. That should bring him so much contentment and happiness that he is just as ready to be the least as others are to be greatest, just as peaceful and contented in the lowest place as he would be in the highest, and just as ready to be despised and rejected and have no fame or reputation as to be honored and important. Your will and the love of your honor should mean more than all other things, and bring more comfort and happiness than all the blessings he has received or expects to receive. Four things that bring great peace. The voice of the Lord. My son, I will teach you the way of peace and true liberty. The disciple. Do this, O Lord. I am eager to hear. The Lord. My son, Try to do another's will rather than your own. Always choose to have less rather than more. Always choose the lowest place and to be less than everyone else. Always long and pray that the will of God may be fully realized in your life. You will find that the man who does all this walks in the land of peace and quietness. The disciple, Lord, what you say is brief, but there's much perfection in it. It's short in words, but rich in wisdom and abounding in fruit. If only I could observe it faithfully, I would not be so easily disturbed. Whenever I feel weighed down and see that my peace is gone, I find that I've drifted from this teaching. You can do all things, and you always love to see the soul making progress. Increase the gift of grace, so that I can do what you say and work out my salvation. A Prayer Against Evil Thoughts O God, be not far from me. O my God, make haste to help me. Great fears and imaginings of all kinds have combined to attack my soul. How can I come through them unharmed? How can I crush them? I will still lead thee on thy way, says the Lord, bending the pride of earth low before thee. I will open the doors of the prison, and hidden treasures I will hand over to thee. O Lord, do as you say, and may all my evil imaginings flee from your presence. My only hope and comfort is to take refuge with you in all my troubles, to trust you, to call out to you from my inmost heart, and patiently wait till you send your comfort. A Prayer for Enlightenment of Mind Good Jesus, enlighten me with the brightness of the inward light, and from the hiding places of my heart bring out all that is dark. Curb the many wanderings of my thoughts, 
and crush the temptations that press me so hard. Fight powerfully for me. Drive from their strongholds the evil desires that lurk to entrap me. Then there will be peace within thy ramparts, and abundant praise will re-echo in the sacred temple that my purified heart shall become. Check the wind and the storms. Say to the sea, Be still, and do not blow to the wind. Then there will be deep calm. As the psalmist says, Shed your light on the earth, for until you enlighten me, I am earth that is empty and waste. Shed your grace on me from above. Bathe my heart in the dew of heaven, and bring in the waters of devotion, so that the face of the earth may be watered, and good fruit be produced, fruit that is the best. Lift up this soul of mine that is crushed with the weight of sins. Draw all my desire up to the things of heaven, so that when I once taste at the joys of the world above, I may find no pleasure in the thought of earthly things. Carry me away, part me from the transient comfort of created things, for nothing that's created can assuage and satisfy my longing. Join me to yourself in the unbreakable bond of love, for you alone can satisfy the yearning of my love, and all things are meaningless without you. On Avoiding Inquisitive Interest in Another's Life The Voice of the Lord my son, you must not be inquisitive and burden yourself with useless cares. All that is no concern of yours. Do thou follow me. It does not matter to you whether that man is good or bad, or what this man does and says. You will not be asked to answer for other people, but you will have to account for yourself. So why involve yourself in other people's lives? I know all men. I see everything that happens under the sun. I know the state of every man. I know what he thinks, what he desires, what his intentions really aim at. So you should entrust it all to me and preserve yourself in quietness and peace, leaving the other man to create what disturbance he pleases. Whatever he does or says will be on his own head, because he cannot deceive me. You must not be interested in acquiring the shadow of a great name or gathering a wide circle of acquaintance or winning personal affection. All these things are the source of distraction and of darkness in the heart. I would gladly speak to you and show you my secrets, if only you would watch eagerly for my coming and open the door of your heart. Live carefully, keep your senses awake to greet the hours of prayer, and show yourself humble in all things. The Basis of Unshakable Peace and Real Progress The Voice of the Lord My son, this is what I once said. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Everyone desires peace, but not everyone cares for the things that bring real peace. My peace is given to those who are humble and gentle in their hearts, and your peace will lie in being very patient, if you listen to me and do what I tell you, you will enjoy great peace. The Disciple What do you want me to do? The Lord At all times, keep your attention fixed on what you are doing and saying, and let your whole aim be to please me and me alone, not seeking or desiring anything outside me. As for the words and actions of others, keep yourself from making rash judgments and do not concern yourself with things that are not your business. Then perhaps you will be free from serious disturbance. But you cannot expect to escape all disturbance during this earthly life, and to be free from all distress of mind and body. That belongs to the peace and quiet of eternity. So you must not imagine that you found true peace if you are not conscious of any burden. Nor must you think all is well if no one stands in your way. You have not achieved perfection just because everything seems to be going the way you'd like it. And if you find yourself in a state of great devotion and happiness, you must not begin to have high ideas and imagine that God loves you more than others. It's not these things that pick out the true lover of goodness and indicate progress and growth in perfection. The Disciple Then what does show these things, Lord? The Lord 
they are shown by the wholehearted surrender of yourself to the will of God, so that you no longer want your own way in anything, great or small, in time or in eternity, but go on thanking God cheerfully amidst prosperity and adversity, laying no more weight on one than on the other. If you have enough courage, patience and trust, when the inward comfort is taken from you, to prepare yourself for even harder things, and instead of complaining that you've done nothing to deserve such suffering, to accept my justice and praise my holiness, whatever I send you, then you will be walking the paths of real peace, and will feel assured of seeing my face and experiencing joy again. For if you achieve complete disregard of self, you will enjoy abundant peace as far as living in this world allows you to do so. The preeminence of a free mind, which is produced by humble prayer rather than by study. The Disciple O Lord, it's the perfect man who can keep his mind intent on heavenly things and pass through all the cares of this life without a sign of care, not because he's insensitive, but because he enjoys the prerogative of a free mind which clings to no created thing with undisciplined affection. Most merciful God, keep me, I pray, from being engrossed by the cares of this life. Keep me from falling victim to pleasure through my body's needs. Keep me from defeat and despair when my soul is molested and hindered. I don't ask you to save me from the things which this foolish world desires so ardently, but from the miseries due to the common curse of mankind, which drag down the soul of your servant and hold him back, so that he cannot enter into the liberty of the Spirit whenever he would like. O oh God, sweetness more than I can say, make bitter for me all earthly comfort that draws me away from love of eternal things, and entices me towards itself with the sight of present pleasure. Save me, O oh my God, save me from defeat by flesh and blood. Do not let the world and his brief glory lead me astray. Do not let the devil and his cunning overthrow me. Give me boldness in resisting, patience in enduring, firmness in persevering. In place of all the joys of the world, grant me the sweet anointing of your spirit and instead of the loves of this life, pour in the love of your name. See what a burden is laid on the ardent spirit by the need for food and drink and clothing and all the other things which keep the body alive. Grant that I may not become too fond of these things for their own sake, but may use them all with moderation. I cannot give them up altogether, since the body needs some care, but the holy law forbids me to seek more than I need merely to give myself pleasure. Otherwise, the body will rebel against the spirit. I pray that amid all these things, your hand may guide and teach me and keep me from excess in anything. Love of self holds you back from the highest good. The voice of the Lord. My son, to receive everything, you must give everything, and not own yourself at all. Realize that love of self does you more harm than anything in the world can. Things cling to you precisely to the extent that you love them. If your love were pure, simple, and properly controlled, you would find yourself set free from the bondage to things. Don't desire things which are not allowed to possess. Don't possess things which may prove a hindrance and rob you of your inward freedom. It's strange that you don't entrust yourself to me from the depths of your heart with all the things you may ever possess or want to possess. Why let yourself be eaten up with useless worries, worn out with pointless cares? Accept what is my will for you, and you will suffer no loss. You will never be happy or content if you hope to acquire something or go somewhere in order to advance your own interests and get your own way. In everything, there will be something to disappoint you, and wherever you go, someone will stand in your way. You will not find happiness in multiplying external possessions, but in despising them and rooting them out of the heart. 
This applies not only to wealth and riches, but to ambition for honours and desire for empty praise, which all pass away with the world. You will find little help from the place you are in if the spirit of fervour is missing, and a peace that depends on outward things will not last long if your heart is away from its true foundation. If you do not rest in me, you may change your state, but not improve it. When the right time comes, you will find the very thing you try to escape, and something more besides. A prayer for purity of heart and heavenly wisdom. O oh God, make me strong with the grace of the Holy Spirit. Strengthen me with a power that reaches my innermost being, so that I may empty my heart of all useless cares and worries, and no longer be torn with a desire for anything, whatever it may be worth, but may know that all things pass away, and that I am passing with them. For there is nothing lasting under the sun, but here all is vanity and an affliction to the spirit. How wise a man is if he knows it. O oh Lord, Grant me heavenly wisdom, so that I may learn above all things to seek you and to find you, above all things to delight in you and love you, and to value everything else according to its place in your wise plan. Grant me the sense to turn a deaf ear to flattery, and patience to bear with contradiction. For it's true wisdom to stand unmoved amidst the changing breeze of men's words, and to give no heed to the seductive voice of the siren. So we shall go on in safety on the road we have begun. Against Maligning Tongues The Voice of the Lord My son, you must not take it badly if some people have a low opinion of you and say things that are not very pleasant to hear. You should have an even lower opinion of yourself and consider that you are more likely to err than anyone. If you are treading the path of the inward life, you will not give much thought to words that soon fly past. It's no small wisdom to keep silent when times are difficult, and to turn to me in your heart, not letting men's judgments disturb you. You must not let your peace depend on what men say, whether they judge you favorably or adversely, that doesn't make you any different from what you are. True peace and true glory can be found only in me, and the secret of great peace is to have no desire to please men and no fear of displeasing them either. It's your undisciplined affections and your foolish fears that make your senses restless and destroy your peace of heart. <laughs> 